Hear the word of God. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals. Do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the workers who serve as wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town, you are welcome to eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there. Tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town will wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray. Well, we thank you for your word this morning, and we pray for a deeper understanding of, of your word and the truths that are held deeply within. Open up our spiritual eyes and, and grant us this understanding. Not only help us to draw these words deeply within, but may we be yielded to them so that they might have an impact upon our characters and upon our very lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Two of my favorite, I should say, unfavorite places are the doctor's office and the emergency room. Man, oh man, I bet you some of you can tell some real stories about your time in either a doctor's office or an emergency room. Not only do you feel bad when you go there, you're sick, but you have to sit for, for hours there in the doctor's office until finally the nurse comes in and calls you in and you go into that little cubicle room and she says, strip down to your underwear and sit on that the cold table there. Then she pokes you and prods you and takes your, takes your blood pressure and checks your heart and, and uh, she says, the doctor will be in to see you in, in a few minutes. So you sit there thinking, the doctor should be in soon. Hours later, the doctor shows up. What's even worse is the emergency room. That can be absolute tor torture, especially if you go to one here in the Ohio Valley lately. The hours slip by as you sit there waiting to be seen, and you think, this is an emergency? Wow. Finally, they get you into that little examination room, and they check you out, and then you have to sit there for six hours before you, they, they send you up to a room in, in, in the hospital. And, and then when they get you up to that room in the hospital, first thing they do, they put that little gown on you. Every time you turn around, you feel like you're exposing yourself. <laughs> then they have a hard time uh, getting the intravenous needle in your, in your arm. And then sometimes they give you the wrong medicines. Woo, it can be an exasperating experience. But what can you do? You're sick. Now, you could go home, I guess, but then you might die. So, you endure. This is exactly how Naaman felt as he searched for a cure for that deadly <coughs> disease he had, known as leprosy. Naaman was a commander in King Aram's army, and King Aram's army was actually an enemy of Israel. They had just made a, a raid, a successful raid against Israel, and they took captives. One of those captives was a young Israelite girl. They made her a servant to Naaman's wife. And so this young slave girl was standing there listening to Naaman complain about this disease that he had. Nobody could cure it. The doctors couldn't cure it. None of the home remedies could cure it. 2 Kings 5, 3. She said to her mistress, this the little servant girl, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. 
Well, a great commander like Naaman usually would not listen to a young slave girl, but again, what could he do? The, the, the choices uh, weren't good. And, and so he decided to go see this prophet, but it could be tricky. How do you go to your enemy and ask a favor? Well, he decided to go to his king, King Aram, to see if King Aram could negotiate with Israel's king. It was kind of like getting a referral from your doctor to go see another doctor. That's what it was like. Well, uh, when the message got to the king uh, of Israel, he got very nervous. He said, what in the world? How in the world are we going to heal this great commander of, of, of leprosy. I, I mean, this can only be trouble. This guy's going to end up dying, and instead of these little raids that our enemies have been making uh, up against us, they're, they're going to come for an all-out battle. Uh, the, the king of Israel was so upset, he tore his robes. That's how upset he was. Then we read this in, in 2 Kings 5 8. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me. And he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So instead of seeing this as a crisis, Elisha saw this as an opportunity. Clearly, Naaman was a desperate man reaching out to his enemies for help. Elisha knew that sometimes God humbles a person. Sometimes God puts a, a person in a very desperate situation before that person looks up and begins to have faith in God. So off Naaman went with his entourage. As I said, he was an important commander. He had horses, he had chariots, he had attendants, the whole shebang. He went there to Elisha's house. When he got there, he, he expected... Uh, Fireworks. Naaman was this kind of a celebrity, a commander of a great army. Surely this prophet would, would come out and, and give him a big welcome, and then there would be this theatrical presentation of the prophet calling God's healing down upon Naaman, and, and certainly a commander like Naaman would deserve all that attention. But instead, Elisha sends out the nurse's aid. Has that ever happened to you? You go to see the doctor, but you have to see the nurse's aid. Well, Alicia sends out his, his helper, and, and uh, oh man, David was upset. 2 Kings 5.10. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be Plan. So not only was it an insult that uh, Elisha sent his nurse's aid out to give him this prescription, but this was a strange prescription. Go wash yourself, dip yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Naaman became very upset, very angry. 2 Kings 5.12 Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, far better than the waters of Israel? Could not wash it down and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Now fortunately for Naaman, his servants were level-headed, and they were able to talk some sense into him. Master, they said, what the prophet is asking you is not that difficult to do. We've come all this way. Can't you at least go down to the Jordan River and Take your medicine, dip yourself seven times. Well, David came to his senses, and, and uh, he did that. He went down into the Jordan, he dipped himself seven times, and, and uh, when he came up out of, out of the water, he was healed. Not only was he healed physically, his body was healed, but spiritually, he made a connection with God. And he established a relationship with God, and he said, from now on, the God of Elisha, the creator of all things, is going to be my God. So he came up there a new man spiritually. Now, have you ever thought about the gospel 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you think about it, it is a strange prescription, but it is a prescription with great power. We tell people that we all have this disease within us that leads to death. It is the disease of, of sin. And the world has no spiritual antibiotics that can help us. There's no spiritual chemo treatments for the cancer of sin within us. However, God offers us the remedy through the Son on the cross. Jesus took upon himself all those deadly sin cells that, that are within us. The cleansing blood of Christ, it is our prescription. It, it cleans us of all the wrongs that we have ever done. And we are fully forgiven by God's grace. And we are raised up to a new life. It's all done through the grace of God in this wonderful prescription, this strange prescription of Christ's sacrifice on the cross which we're totally forgiven. That prescription has to sound strange, especially to people who are having a, a good time in the world and don't even realize they are infected. A lot of them will laugh in our face that they'll, they'll even make fun of Jesus and, and make fun of the Christian gospel. But this is what Jesus told his disciples. Luke 10, 2 and 3, he told them the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. So despite the reception that his disciples just might receive, Jesus said, go anyway. Go and, and share this gospel. There are going to be people out there who do not want to hear it. They're having too much fun in the world. They've been conditioned by all that they hear in the world. They just they, they think that the Christians are the bad guys. They grasp at any teaching or philosophy that fits their selfish pursuits and tickles their ears and justifies their acts. When you run into people who are not yet ready to hear this strange prescription, this gospel of Jesus Christ, he said, do this. But when you enter a town and are not welcome, go into the streets and say, even the dust of your town will wipe off our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this. The kingdom of God has come near. Jesus said, don't waste your time arguing with people that aren't ready to hear the gospel of Christ. He said, wipe the dust off your feet and move on. Now, why did he say that? Why did he say that? He said that because there are hundreds and thousands of people who are ready to hear the gospel. They're out there. And, and, and most of them, their hearts have been made ready by what they've gone through. Most people are, aren't ready to listen to the gospel until they've gone through some difficult times, like David. Most people are, aren't ready to hear the strange prescription of God's grace through Jesus and the cross uh, uh, until they've hit rock bottom. That's, that's when they, they begin to look up. That's when it begins to make sense that they need forgiveness and they need new life. It's when the, the consequences of their life choices catches up with them finally. And, and they begin to understand how much they need the grace of God. When Jesus' disciples came back to report to him, they were filled with joy. Why were they filled with joy? Because this strange prescription worked. People were healed. People were forgiven. People were given new life. But here's the problem. Jesus told his disciples this earlier. He said the harvest is plentiful. There are so many people out there waiting to hear but the labors are few. May God direct each and every one of us to a neighbor, to someone in our lives who are ready to hear about the grace of God and the forgiveness of God through Jesus Christ. May God direct each of us to a neighbor. Amen.
Let's go to our uh, 